Out of all the mythical creatures out there, a unicorn has got to be one of the most plausible, right? I mean, a unicorn is basically just a horse with a horn. The world's given us horses, the world's given us horns, so why hasn't the world given us unicorns? Well, in this episode of Scullywag Speculative, we're going to break down the function and evolution of horns in big mammalian herbivores and uncover exactly why unicorns have never become a thing. And then we'll take a look at what a real-life unicorn might actually look like based on the trends we see in evolution. Dr. Rex here, welcome to the Scullywag Lab where I break down the bare bones fundamentals of skull science. Unicorns, majestic, magical, mythical, and yet surprisingly, ancient cultures didn't see unicorns as fantasy. Instead, unicorns were considered real animals and were listed in medieval bestiaries alongside lions and bears. And I guess it's understandable, a unicorn doesn't really look physically impossible. A horse with a horn. That's nowhere near as crazy as a centaur or a griffin or anything like that. So where are the unicorns? Now I know what you're thinking. There are a few animals around today that are sometimes called unicorns. Like the narwhal for example. But the narwhal is aquatic for starters. And it also doesn't really have a horn at all. It's actually a tusk or a giant tooth. I mean, can you imagine if we had unicorns built like narwhals with a giant tooth poking out of their mouth? <laughs> Okay, so what about rhinos? I mean, after all, Marco Polo's description of a unicorn sounds suspiciously like the description of a rhino to me. Well, firstly, rhinos are built more like tanks than majestic, agile unicorns. Secondly, the main horn of a rhino tends to be positioned closer to the tip of the snout than on the forehead like we see in unicorns. And there's an obvious reason for this. It relates to how horns help enhance fighting behaviors. In large herbivorous mammals, Horns usually evolve as elaborate extensions to their skulls that can improve the effectiveness of their fighting. Now, there's no denying that fights are unpredictable, chaotic madness, but that doesn't mean that different species don't have like an underlying fighting style. And it's these fighting styles that tend to be supported by various headgear seen in big herbivores. For example, species that ram hard into each other have solid, robust horns to take heavy blows, while species that lock horns and wrestle around tend to have more elaborate structures that help them lock onto each other. There's also some bigger species that do a little bit of everything, and they also have the headgear to support all those behaviors. In rhinos, the most frequent attack we see is this vertical stroke of the head, and it's usually aimed at the side of the opponents to try to destabilize them. This means the horn is best positioned towards the tip of the snout, where the most velocity and momentum occurs during that vertical stroke. And the curvature of the horn acts like a reinforcement along this arc that the head takes. It's really cool. But unlike rhinos, unicorns usually have their horn positioned further back on their foreheads. When forehead or frontal horns are present in rhinos, they tend to be smaller, secondary horns, most likely functioning to support the primary nasal horns during heavy lifting of opponents. There is a possible exception to this in the giant extinct Elasmotherium. This species has a chunky forehead region suggested to have supported an enormous horn. But no such horn has ever been found, and a recent study from 2021 suggested the structure of this hump on the Elasmotherium skull was probably unlikely to support a gigantic horn. Other big herbivores, like some of the extinct bronotheres, had bony extensions on their nasal bones, which would probably have functioned similar to rhinos, but those aren't very unicorn-like either. To build a unicorn, we really want that horn to be on the forehead. So let's take a look at some other forehead horns seen in big mammalian herbivores. There's basically four types. The growth of each of these is slightly different in the way the bony part of the horn originates and grows through different layers of bone and skin. Of all of these, I think the best candidate for a unicorn horn would probably be the bovid type, which we see in animals like goats and bulls. Let's go through all these types of horns and you'll see why. Pronghorns have the most similar horns to the bovid type, but they have this extra part which wouldn't really look right. It'd look more like, well, a prong. Funny that. Giraffe horns are simple bony structures covered in skin and don't have the thick keratin layer that we usually associate with horns, which isn't quite what we're after. Deer antlers look really cool, there's no denying that, but they're temporary outgrowths of bone that fall off after every mating season, with new ones growing every year. I reckon a unicorn horn needs to be permanent, otherwise it's not a unicorn for some of the year. So that leaves us with the bovids as the best candidates from which to make a unicorn. Okay, so here's the million dollar question then. 
why haven't any of these types of horns evolved in horses before? And I think this at least partly comes down to their anatomy and how they fight with it. Horses are quite nimble and regularly use powerful kicks in fighting and predator defense. But they also have something else that all these other giraffes, deer, cows, goats and pronghorn don't have. What? A nice big set of upper front chompers. Male horses bite each other a lot during their competition for mating rights. An absence of these upper teeth might have influenced the evolution of horns because without an ability to bite each other, males of all these species needed something to intimidate and hurt each other with. Otherwise they'd just be gumming each other into submission, which is kind of gross and would probably just make predators laugh at them. So if we want to build a more realistic looking unicorn, it's most likely going to be a species without upper teeth. And bovids are probably the best option because of their permanent spiraling horn type. So we know our realistic unicorn would probably be a bovid. But unicorns are usually depicted with a single spiraling horn emerging from their forehead. Is this realistic? Not especially. The spiraling we see in modern unicorn horns came from the sales of narwhal horns as unicorn horns in the Middle Ages, believe it or not. But the functional reasons behind the spiraling of bovid horns don't really work as well for a single horn as they do for paired horns. Spiraling of horns is thought to help the horns of opponents to grip each other during fights, help prevent fractures across the horn structure, and to prevent rotation of the keratin sheath around a horn's bony core during clashing and wrestling. One reason a single horn probably wouldn't be spiraled is that a single horn wouldn't really be able to lock onto another single horn during fighting like a pair of horns can. Secondly, evolving fewer than two horns is unlikely as well. There's plenty of examples of species and breeds having more than two horns, but not really fewer than two horns. I mean, it's maybe possible that one of the paired horns could be secondarily lost, and the horn butt of the remaining horn could migrate to the midline of the skull during development. This kind of thing must have happened in the evolution of the narwhal tooth, and we see similar migration in the eyes of flatfish across their midline as they grow. The problem with this happening in horns is that even a small reduction in the size of one of the paired horns would require, at minimum, a temporary reduction in the ancestor's effectiveness in battle. This kind of development is super unlikely to make it to later generations under natural selection or sexual selection. Thirdly, while matching horns tend to spiral with bilateral symmetry, a single spiraling horn would be an asymmetrical structure in the midline of the skull. This is almost unheard of in animals. There's plenty of examples of asymmetry in skulls, don't get me wrong, but I can only think of one example offhand of asymmetry in a midline structure of the skull, and that's the rye bill, which has its beak bent to the side to access bugs under rocks and things. Awesome. Let me know if you can think of any others. And finally, the straightforward pointing structure of the classic unicorn horn isn't very biomechanically practical for any purpose. It's not like the rhino horn which follows the arc of their head movements, nor is it like the antlers that can lock together or the robust horns of head butters. Its long, straight, skinny shape means it would probably snap off at the base if used for any physical activities. Since it's unlikely that any horn in the real world is going to be shooting rainbows and sparkles out of it, I think we're out of luck in finding a reasonable purpose for a horn of the shape and structure depicted on unicorns. So taking all this into account, I'm going to now show you what I think nature's best effort at a real life unicorn might look like. Here we go. So you can see we're working with a skull of a bovid. It's a gazelle actually. And this skull does retain two horns like most other bovids. In this case, I use the horns of a tamaraw. But unlike other bovids, the two horns have evolved to grow together. They're still two separate horns, don't get me wrong, but they form a single structure. This means we can still have some spiraling going on, but it maintains its bilateral symmetry. This might be possible if the male ancestors of this animal shifted their fighting behaviors to involve more vertical thrusting into the side of their opponents, rather than the face-to-face -face wrestling we see in other gazelles. So we might consider this as a gazelle that has evolved to be more similar to a rhino. With a build like this, our unicorn would probably be more gladiator than glitter, and ultimately, that's what having horns is all about. I guess nature will probably never create a unicorn like the ones we see in the stories, but maybe the best unicorns that nature has to offer really are the ones that we met along the way. Thanks for visiting the lab. If you appreciate this content, leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.